Well, a decorated Navy captain was at sail in the dark of night. And as he turned his gaze across the black moonlit ocean, he saw some faint lights in the distance, but they were closing in fast. Now, it's standard protocol when you're sailing that you, you radio the other vessels to avoid a, a collision between two oncoming boats. So the captain, he uh, immediately tells his signalman to send a message. And the message said this, uh, alter your course 10 degrees to the south. Well, a message promptly returned, uh, and to the captain's surprise, it read, you alter your course 10 degrees north. Now, the, the captain was kind of angered by this because he was used to being the one giving the orders, and now this person is, is telling him what to do and disregarding what he told him. And so the captain decides to pull rank to let whoever this person is know who he's talking to. So he sends a message back and he says, alter your course immediately, 10 degrees to the south. I am the captain. Well, soon another message, uh, snarkily received, uh, was sent back and it read this, no, you alter your course 10 degrees to the north. I am Seaman Third Class Jones. Well, this uh, completely annoyed the captain, uh, and now he wanted to strike some fear into this unruly sailor. Uh, so he sends a message back. He wants to let this person know exactly what kind of ship he is playing chicken with. And so the message said this, alter your course immediately 10 degrees to the south. I am a Zumwalt class destroyer battleship. Now the captain thought for sure this is going to strike some fear into this unruly sailor. Uh, and everyone knows sailing out in the seas that the Zumwalt class battleship destroyer is the biggest, the baddest, most dangerous battleship that the United States Navy has in its fleet. Well, a reply came over, over, across the uh, radio and it said this, you alter your course 10 degrees to the north, I am a lighthouse. You see, sometimes it is vitally important to know who you are talking to, to know the identity of who's on the other line, because it can have monumentous consequences. In the passage of Scripture that we're going to be going through today, the Jewish religious leaders are talking to Jesus, uh, and they knew of this Jesus figure from the reputations and all that stuff, but they did not know the true identity of the person they were talking to. But in this passage, Jesus reveals his true identity to the Jewish religious leaders. And this understanding this scripture is, uh, is vitally important because you understand exactly who Jesus is. And that is the most important thing we can do this side of heaven is understand who Jesus the Christ truly is. The amazing thing about this scripture that we're going to go through today is that it came directly from Jesus' mouth. It was recorded by the Apostle John. And we've been going through a series through the book of John and we learned that the whole reason why John wrote his gospel was this. He, he, read it, he wrote it in John chapter 20, verse 31. He says, but I've written these things so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so we're going to continue in our series through the book of John, and we're going to finish up the, the next half of John chapter 5. We went through the first half last week, and the verses we're going to cover is John chapter 5, verse 19 through 29. And so if you guys, uh, if you guys can turn there through your Bibles, if you don't have a Bible, you can always download the YouVersion app, hit the live button, all the scriptures are there for us. Now, uh, before we dive into that section of scripture, I want to uh, uh, catch you guys up and give you guys some background and context. Uh, but before we do that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we just thank you for the word that you left. Lord, would you just use uh, the words that are spoken, the words that are written to, to uh, speak to our hearts, that you would open up our hearts to hear exactly what you want us to hear. Lord, we want to know your true identity. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we, just to, to catch you up a bit of background, last week, Pastor Kyle took us through the first half of John chapter 5, and we learned about one of the most amazing miracles that Jesus did in his ministry when he uh, healed 
the crippled man who had been crippled for 38 years. It was miraculous. He simply went into uh, the colonnade and he spoke to this crippled man and said, get up, take your mat and walk. And miraculously, he did. See, Jesus went into a a place and he showed mercy uh, to a place that was filled with misery. It was incredible. Now, Jesus purposely did this miracle on the Sabbath day, the Jewish day of rest, uh, for a reason. So you're not supposed to do anything on the Sabbath day. But he did this, this miracle on this day so that he would spark a reaction with the Jewish religious leaders. And sure enough, it did. You see, the Jewish religious leaders, they ended up condemning the man who, who uh, was healed. Instead of rejoicing and saying, wow, that's amazing, you're healed. They, instead, they said, what are you doing carrying your mat? That's against the law. And then they went over to, to Jesus and confronted him and said, what are you doing healing? That's also against the law. You can't do that on the Sabbath. You see, this interaction is what Jesus wanted because in the dialogue that follows, which we're going to cover, uh, we're going to, Jesus uses this time to uh, explain to them exactly who he is. And, and it's, it's very amazing because he, he tells the, G, the Jewish religious leaders that he's more than just a simple miracle worker. Uh, so the, this dialogue, it actually reveals his identity in the most clearest of ways in all of Scripture. And so it's important that we understand this because Jesus undoubtedly declares his deity to the Pharisees. Now, if you guys came in here, you guys got a note sheet. It's a way that we follow along with the message. And that's your first point in your note sheet is that Jesus undoubtedly declared his deity. He undoubtedly declared his deity. You know, I went to a secular college before I I transferred to go to a Bible school. And um, I had a professor who claimed uh, blatantly in front of the classroom uh, that this person, this person of Jesus, uh, actually never is announced or said that he was God. You know, there's, there's a whole uh, a liberal belief of liberal the- theologians that claim this, that say that Jesus never claimed to be God. He never claimed his deity. You know, these people never read John chapter 5 and understood it because Jesus clearly and blatantly does. Now, before we jump into uh, the text that we're going to cover, I want to rewind two verses back to verse 17. And we covered this last week, but uh, this is what happened. This is what Jesus said to the religious leaders right after they confronted him about healing this man on the Sabbath. And this is what Jesus says, verse 17. But Jesus answered them, the religious leaders, my father is working until now, and I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. You see, the religious leaders, they completely understood uh, what Jesus was claiming. They did not miss the fact that Jesus just referred to God in a way they never would. You see, Jesus, uh, he he doesn't refer to God in, in some general sense, like our God, the God. He refers to God in a personal sense. He says, my father. Uh, And they knew that clearly when Jesus said that, when he referred to God as my father in this unique way, he was declaring himself equal to God. And that's why the the religious leaders, they changed their charge from simply breaking the Sabbath to blasphemy. And they understood that Jesus was calling himself God, equal to God. And that's why the reaction was, hey, we need to kill this guy. Uh, and he is blatantly blaspheming, and he's not just blatantly blaspheming, but continuously, because in the Greek, the verbs that are used in this verse are in the continuous tense. So it actually means that he habitually and continuously uh, equated himself to God. And throughout his ministry in this gospel and other gospels, we see that. You see, and and Jesus was completely aware that the Jewish religious leaders had this judgment over him, and, and he understood that. But you know what? Instead of denying it, instead of disputing it or diminishing their deduction about him, Jesus drives the point home and says uh, what he's going to say in the coming text that we're going to read. And it's uh, in 19 through 29, and he makes some bold claims in this passage of Scripture. Uh, He reveals his identity, and it actually sets into motion the plot to have Jesus killed, which actually happens 18 months later in the crucifixion. And, And this passage of scripture, it actually sets into motion God's ultimate plan of redemption. And so, let's read what Jesus said to the religious leaders at verse 19 through 29 of John chapter 5. 
So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, And those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this. For an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. This is the most definitive declaration of Jesus' deity in all of Scripture. And in this text, Jesus claims equality with God the Father. And he does it in four ways. And we're going to break down this Scripture uh, piece by piece. And this is the next point in your note sheets. Jesus claimed to be equal to God the Father in this first way, in wisdom. Jesus claims to be equal to God the Father in wisdom. You see, in, in verse 19 through 20, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, Only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. See, Jesus sees what God the Father sees. The omniscient God of the universe, knower of all things, is willing to show all that he sees and knows to the Son. That is why time and time again in Jesus' ministry, people were astonished by what he did. In Mark chapter 1, verse 22, it says, And they were astonished at his teachings, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. Jesus, throughout his ministry, supernaturally knew things that nobody could have known. Uh, Like, for example, the case with the woman at the well. He revealed things to her that that nobody could have known. He revealed her her deepest secrets, and, and, and he showed that he had supernatural knowledge. He also did that with Nathaniel, the apostle, when he called him uh, to follow him. He knew that Nathaniel was sitting underneath this fig tree when no one was around. And Nathaniel was like, how could you have known that? Nobody saw that. And, and he, not only that, but when he saw Nathaniel, he, he spoke directly into his character and says, I know you. I know who you are before even meeting him. Jesus also knew how many times that Peter was going to deny him before the rooster crowed. Uh, he knew things that were going to happen before they even happened. He had supernatural insight because he was equal with the Father, uh, the Father who, who is this omniscient God who knows all things, also shows the Son all things. And, and they were equal. And Jesus claimed and proved that his wisdom was beyond the human level. It's on a divine level. That's why in Colossians chapter 2, verse 3, it speaks of Jesus and it says that Jesus is in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden within the person of Jesus. Now, can you imagine Jesus as a teenager? That must have been some very difficult parenting years for for Mary and Joseph. Uh, Can you imagine being in the parental shoes of Mary and Joseph with a teenage Jesus? Right? Some of you parents know this, and you're parenting some teenagers, and they're at that phase of life where they think they know it all. Right? Right? Can you imagine Mary and Joseph saying, Jesus, stop talking like you know it all. Oh, wait, you do know it all. (laughs) Well, speaking of parenting, a a little side note. Did you know that that 80%, it said that 80% of what a child learns and retains is actually caught from within their household instead of taught from a classroom? So you could send your kids to school and and extracurricular activities, and you can even send them to Sunday school and, and youth group, but the majority of what they learn and retain is caught from within the household. So, parents, it is vitally important that you intentionally invest in teaching and modeling to your kids. 
And, and the most important thing that you can do for your kids is to model godliness to them, to make sure that they are catching the good stuff, the God stuff. And, and know this, that parents, it's never too late to start, never too late to start modeling godliness to your kids. You see, just as the Father loves the Son, Jesus loves you. And he knows every hair on your head. He knows every star in the sky. He's the God who knows the secrets of the universe, and he's the God who knows your innermost heart and what makes you smile. And for that, we can have comfort in knowing that the God who loves me knows me. Now, the second thing that, that Jesus claimed to be equal to God the Father in is works. That's the next point of your note sheet. In, he's equal to God the Father in works. Moving on, going on in uh, verse 19, the, the last half of it, it says, For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. And greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. Now, this is a sen sensational claim. Whatever the Father does, so the, the Son does likewise. That, that means that all the works that Jesus did are, are a perfect reflection of the will of God, the Father. All the healings, all the miracles, every single word spoken uh, was done because a loving Father willed it and a loving Son obeyed and made it happen. Now, the most remarkable of those works is the giving of life, which we just read. You see, man, man can give medicine when sickness comes. Man can give uh, food when hunger comes. Man can give help when weakness comes. Man can give love when loneliness comes. But when death comes, man can only provide sympathy and compassion, never the gift of life. Only God can do that. And the Jewish leaders completely knew that. De declaring uh, to be the source of life is a claim that only God can make. You see, imagine if you had uh, one of those old-fashioned Olympic torches, right? Now, you cannot light that torch if your torch itself is not lit. You know what I'm saying? You get it? it to, to be able to give fire to another torch you have to be the source of fire. You have to have fire in itself, right? Now, likewise, if you are to give life, you cannot give life unless you are the source of life. And that's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying that I am equal to God the Father, and he has given me authority over life. You see, the giver of life is reserved for God alone. And he just, Jesus just said to the religious leaders, yeah, I can do that too. Now, Jesus claimed equality with God in works. And through Jesus' works, we can see that the will and the heart of God the Father. For everything that Jesus did, it, it, all the way to the redemptive work on the cross, was out of love. It was out of love to give life, to restore life to you and I. And so we see the heart of the Father through the works of the Son. And through it, we know that God is love. Now, the third thing that Jesus claimed to be equal to God the Father in is worth. He claimed to be equal in worth. In John chapter 5, verse 23, it says that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Worship, worship means to ascribe worth to someone or, or something. That's why um, anything can... Uh, Worship can, you can worship anything. Anything can become your idol if you ascribe worth to it. Uh, saying or showing that something or someone has uh, worth is by giving your time, giving your resources, your money, your life. That's all acts of worship. So anything can become an idol. And the religious authorities knew that God the Father is worthy of all worship. It should all be directed to him. But here Jesus is saying, as you honor and worship the Father, so equally you should worship the Son, me. Now, worship is so much more. It's so much more than just singing a few songs before the message. It's deeper than that. You see, worship through song is ascribing worth to Jesus with our hearts because we're saying, Jesus, you are worthy of my praise. Now, there are many acts of worship. That's why we say that when you tithe, it is an act of worship because you're saying, God, you are worth more than my money. 
Uh, when you attend church, when you go to small group, when you serve, it, it is an act of worship because you're saying, God, you are worth more than my time. When you study the scriptures and pray, that is an act of worship because you are saying, God, you are worth getting to know. You are worth speaking to. And obedience is the biggest act of worship because you are saying that, God, you are worth more than my own selfish desires and my will. And so when you love your enemies, that's an act of worship. When, when you care for the widows, the orphans, and the sick, that is an act of worship because you are obeying the will of God the Father. Now, the essence of, of worship, what it means to honor God, it is revealed in what Jesus called the greatest commandment. Some of you guys might be familiar with this. It's found in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. Uh, Jesus says this, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Worship is loving God with your entire being, your heart, your soul, your mind, your physical self, your spiritual self, your mental self. It's all ascribing worth to God. And Jesus is saying, I am equal in worth to the Father, so I am deserving of that worship as well. And lastly, the fourth thing that, that this scripture says that Jesus claimed to be equal to God the Father in is authority. Authority. From verse 24 to 29, let's read this. It says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly. I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself and he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. With these words, Jesus lifted himself far above the level of any mere man, stating that, that the Father has, gives him authority, gives the Son authority over life and of judgment. And, and if you missed it, in verse 27, he, he said he made the claim, and he claimed the title, the Son of Man, which is a direct reference to the Messianic prophecy that was found in Daniel uh, chapter 7. There's so many layers of prophecy that Jesus is fulfilling here. And the religious leaders, they knew that the authority over life is reserved for God. And also the authority to judge someone after life, it's something only God can do. But here Jesus is saying, I can do that. You see, let's be honest, nobody likes to be judged, right? Anybody like being judged here? No? Well, there is a famous philosopher. His name was Tupac Shakur. He was also a rapper. Uh, he, famous, he was known for families saying this line, only God can judge me. And, and yes, that is true. Uh, it, only God can judge you. And here Jesus is saying, yeah, only God can judge you. But guess what? God the Father just gave me the authority to do the judging because we are equal. Now, the implications of that is massive because Jesus, because of what Jesus did on the cross. You see, Jesus judges man in light, in light of the finished redemptive work of the cross. Uh, Romans 3.23 says this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned. And God the Father knew this, that man would love the darkness more than the light, and they would be drawn more to their sin. And man would continue to fail the standards of holiness. And so if man was judged based on their sinful works alone, we would fail every single time and end up facing the judgment of death. So he sent Jesus his son, to die in man's place on the cross. And then he gave him authority to do the judging. That is amazing that the one who judges us is also the one that offers redemption to us. Now Jesus in these passages claimed equality with God the Father in wisdom, in works, in, in worth, in authority. He declared his deity. Uh, he, he said that he is equal to God the Father now, this is the beautiful mystery of the triune God, the doctrine of the Trinity. Three distinct persons, all equally a singular God in essence. One God, three persons. Jesus is saying that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, guess what? I'm one of them. I'm one of them, and I am equal to God the Father. 
Uh, at some point in all of our lives, at some point in all of, all of our lives, we're going to have to answer this question. And it is the most important question of your eternal lives. And it is this. Who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? And the way you answer this question will determine where you end up in eternity. Who is Jesus to you? See, Jesus, he didn't leave us very many options to, to choose from. So he kind of narrowed the multiple choice down a bit and simplified it for us. Because he, the only options that he left for us to answer with that question, who is Jesus to you, is this. This is the next point of your note sheets. Jesus is either a lunatic, a liar, or the Lord. You see, I've, I've heard many people uh, when asked, what do you think about Jesus? Uh, and they say, oh, I got a positive response about him. Yeah, he's a cool guy. Uh, he was a great man. He was a good moral teacher. Um, he had a lot of good lessons. I watched his TED Talk. It was awesome. Uh, but what good moral teacher would blatantly claim to be God and say that I am equal to God in wisdom, works, and worth? I have authority over life and authority to judge you after you die. I, ha I hold the power. Who, what kind of moral teacher would say that? See, Jesus does not leave us the option to simply say, oh, he was just a good guy who lived. No, because of his outrageous claims he made. See, the only option that we have is either Jesus is a lunatic, uh, a man who was blatantly blaspheming and absolutely bonkers, deserving death uh, in the Jewish religious leader's eyes or worthy of being thrown into a mental institute because he's saying he's God, uh, or he was a liar, someone who was deceiving the whole world with some kind of magic trickery, or he really was who he said he was, the Lord. And so, who is Jesus to you? Uh, the way you answer this question puts you in one of two categories. Uh, either he's not the Lord, he's, he's a lunatic, he's, he's a liar, and, and that puts you in the category that leads you to death, or he really was who he said he was, and he is the Lord. And that puts you in the category that leads you to life. And I pray that every single person who hears this would fall into the category that leads you to life and make Jesus your Lord. Because making Jesus your Lord does two things. And this is the next point. Making Jesus your Lord does two things. The first one is it resurrects you from death to life. Listen, every single person that is here, every single person that you uh, come face to face with, uh, Every single person on this planet, you and me, we are all everlasting spiritual beings housed in a physical body. At one point, your physical body will fail. It will pass. But your spiritual being will go on. And where it goes is determined by how you answer this question. You see, as Christians, we believe this. We believe in the resurrection. And we just sang that in that, that song. We believe in the resurrection. That, that there is life after death. And, and there was a pastor who once said this. Those who are born once will die twice, but those who are born twice will only die once. Now, what does he mean by that? He means this. Every single one of us will face a physical death. At one point, our bodies will fail. We will die. But not every single one of us has to face a spiritual death, the death of a soul, which is eternal separation from God. You see, making Jesus the Lord of your life moves you from death to life. And it's not about good works, and it's not about uh, uh, paying your bills on time. It's not about coming to church and having perfect attendance. It's not about being nice or paying your taxes. It's all good, right? But none of that qualifies you for everlasting life. So what does? Well, Jesus says this, and, and we were just read it in verse 24, chapter 5. He said two things are required. Those who hears my word and believes him who sent me. Now, the Apostle Paul, he, he said it. Uh, best in Romans 10, uh, verse 9 through 10. He says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your hearts that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes in, unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So making Jesus your Lord, will, it resurrects you from death to life. And the second thing that it does of making Jesus your Lord makes you adopted sons and daughters of God. It makes you adopted sons and daughters of God. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 through 7, says it best. God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, 
so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that, he might re- that we might receive adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. You see, if Jesus is the Lord of your life, you have been adopted into the family of God as his children, moving from death to life and moving into the family of God. And that requires a response from your life. Uh, Ephesians 5 verse 1 says, Therefore, therefore, in light of your salvation, in light of your adoption, being children of God, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. So our lives should change now, now that we have been adopted into his family. There should be a difference, and we should strive uh, to, to have be imitators of God and have his characteristics, and most importantly, uh, to add and adopt into our lives the greatest of his characteristics, which is sacrificial love. Sacrificial love. It's all about love, guys. It's all about love. Uh, It is for this reason that he did it all. And and if we missed it, in, in verse 20, he says it. For the Father loves the Son, That is why he shows him all things. That is why he gives him equality. That is why he gives him authority, because the Father loves the Son. It is because of love that that we are redeemed so that we would be a a perfect uh, bride for Jesus. It is because of love, for God so loved the world that he gave. It is all because of love. And what's beautiful about the, the way love was written in verse 20 is in the Greek tense, this verse is, is uh, it's written in the continual tense. It's a habitual love. It's a never-ending love. And so what it's saying is God the Father will never cease to love. He will never cease to love. He will always love you. He will continually love you no matter what you do, no matter how bad you fail. God the Father will always love you. And his heart is simple, is that you would love him back. And make Jesus your Lord. Now I want to end uh, with the words of former President Ronald Reagan. He was actually asked this exact question in an interview. Someone asked him, who is Jesus to you? And he answered it. And this is amazing. The former president, Ronald Reagan, he once was the most powerful man on the planet, answered this question in this way. He says, I can't help wondering how we can explain away the greatest miracle recorded in history. No one denies there was such a man that he lived and that he was put to death by crucifixion. Where's the miracle that I spoke of? Well, consider this, and let your imagination translate the story into our own time, possibly into your own hometown. A young man whose father is a carpenter grows up working in his father's shop. One day, he puts down the tools And he walks out of his father's shop and he starts preaching on the street corners and nearby countrysides, walking from place to place, preaching all the while, even though he is not an ordained minister. He does this for three years. Then he is arrested, tried, and convicted. There's no court of appeal, so he's executed at age 33 along with two common thieves. Those in charge of his execution roll the dice to see who gets his clothing, the only possessions that he has. His family cannot afford a burial place, so he's buried in a borrowed tomb. End of story, right? No. This uneducated young man with no earthly property, who left no written word, has for 2,000 years had a greater impact on the world than all the rulers, than all the kings, than all the emperors, conquerors, generals, admirals, scholars, scientists, and philosophers who have ever lived all of them put together, Jesus has had more of an impact. How can you explain that unless he really was who he said he was? And so who do you say that Jesus is? Who do you say that Jesus is? That is the most important question that you can answer. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this written word We thank you that you revealed your identity. Lord, you are God. You declared your deity and you proved it. We thank you that 
you came and you offered salvation and redemption to us. That you are who you said you are. And you did what you said you would do to redeem us from our sins. And we thank you for that. God, if there is someone in here that, that you are working in their heart, Lord, would you just begin to tug and speak to them? See, maybe it's you where this question is, is lingering in your head and you don't know if you answered it correctly. Well, there's no better time to answer this question than today, than right now, where Cinco de Mayo 2019 can be the day that you find true freedom from your sin and redemption and adoption into the family of God. And if that's you, would you just pray this prayer? Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Forgive me for the things that I've done. I acknowledge that you are who you said you are. That you are the Lord. Now it's much more than just knowing, but I want you to be the Lord of my life. Would you lead me? Would you guide me? I submit everything I am to you, 100%. Lord, teach me how to live in your ways. Holy Spirit, would you come and live inside? Thank you for the redemption and forgiveness of sins. Lord, I want to honor you with my life. You are my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.